Oh yeah, oh yeah. What's going on, everyone? Clark Bartram here with my man, Jeremy Jackson. And brother, we're doing our first podcast. Woo! What do you think about that? Uh, feeling great. Yeah. I, I'm thinking a lot. Thinking yeah. a lot about it. So we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to say. But let's just hear his music for a second. Uh, oh, that's giving me the energy. It's giving me the mood. It's giving me what we need to do right now to reach out to the world and touch these people. So go ahead, Jim. We got our producer, Jim, in the house. Yep. Providence Video Productions. But guys, listen, our goal in this podcast, number one, is to entertain you and bring you some fun. I think that, Jeremy, this world needs fun. What do you think? Oh, my gosh. Without fun, what's the use of any of it? Right. So I'd be able to enjoy it. I couldn't have thought of a more fun guy to do this with than Jeremy Jackson. So what we're going to be doing in this podcast, and everyone's been asking me, Jeremy, they're like, hey, man, do you have a format? Do you know what you do? Do you have this scripted out? And the reality and the truth is, no, I never have any kind of plan for anything I do. I just go out and do it. Wing it. Wing it. With our priorities in order, we, you know, what, what is the foundation? We, got? we know what our foundation in our life is. You, we know we're on purpose, right? We know we want to share information. We want to share love. We want to grow in information and knowledge. And we want to create community with people that, that feel that energy and that vibe with us. So that's all that really matters. Anything that springs forward from there or grows from that is just, that's fruit, just... fruit on the tree. We, we know where our roots are. Right. That's Woo! it. That's the bottom line. So here... We're going to be bringing you guys guests. We both have a pretty good Rolodex of people that we know from Super Bowl champions to actors to Navy SEALs, you name it. We're going to be bringing them on here. But the main focus of this podcast will be Jeremy and I talking about just life situations. And I couldn't think of a better guest than my co-host today, Jeremy Jackson. So for those of you who don't know him, this guy is probably one of the most famous actors in the world. You might not recognize him right now, but he was on one of the biggest television shows in the known universe, and the name of that show was Baywatch. It's Brother, true. so we're going to jump off into that right away because I'm really intrigued by that story. I mean, so many people want to be famous. So many people want to be on TV. You did that. So let's jump into the height of that right now. I was thinking about this. Tell me, what was it like at the peak of your success on the most successful show known to mankind? Mm, mm, that's a, I mean, you were how old and what was going on? That's a big question. I was uh, at the peak, you know, probably 12, 13, 14. You know, those, those are years. formidable years, yeah. 12, 13, 14. Yeah, and yeah. You're, not, you're making a lot of money, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. How much money? Uh, you know, I was probably making around seven grand a week. Seven grand a week at 13 mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. I know people right now in the year 2018. Actually, I think it was like 14 grand a week, something like that. A lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More yeah. money than you ever knew what to do I with. Think Did I was you have stealing someone? about seven of it from myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it like? Okay, so you show up on set, you're surrounded by beautiful people. I mean, it was like a literal dream. Like someone, a 13 year old kid, I mean, your testosterone is, is raging, oh, you've got God, money. Was, yeah. I mean, what's it like, dude? Ah, oh, man, you know. I would really like to sit here and tell you that it was amazing and I enjoyed it, but I can't, I can't tell you that because I was, well, first and foremost, I, I, I envisioned it since I was a little kid, right? So when I was real young, you know, I started acting when I was six, but even with two, three, four, I sat in the bedroom and practiced, 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 sang, sang. Dance, dance, recorded radio shows, made my own pretend radio shows, dressed up, did impersonations, listened to records, tried it again, tried it, did, listen, tried it again. So like I, I didn't know anything about the entertainment industry, but I would watch Michael Jackson, I would watch Elvis Presley, um, and, and I would be like, man, that's the coolest thing to be entertained people like that. That's the coolest thing ever. And I just loved that. I had a passion for that innate, you know, congenital, whatever you want to call it. It was in my DNA. I wanted it. So I kind of manifested it. I worked on it before I knew it was a job. It was just a passion. But then when I, once I had it, I can't really ever tell you that I ever enjoyed it. Really? Yeah. Because it was, it, I, I, paid attention to the problems more than the more than the good stuff um, dude that's a really good thing to stop on for a second yeah. right there how many people in life pay attention to the problems and they pay attention to the good stuff absolutely we sit around and complain about oh it's so cold outside but you know what i mean we we mm -hmm. complain about the wrong stuff so i just want you guys to think about that for a second as we go on because i am really intrigued by the fact that 
You were a legitimate star on the biggest show in the world, but you were not enjoying yourself. Oh man, there's there's less girls waiting for me here to get my autograph than there are for David. Mm, I just want to be the bigger star. Wow. Like, it, like little things like that. Oh, there's nobody here today waiting for my autograph. Oh, I must not be good enough. Yeah. So that that is self-doubt creeping in and all that sort of stuff. So we're not going to get off on some motivational <laughs> tangent right now. So I want to stay on the 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 fact that, you know, this. Sh- how many people saw what continents did it play in? Where didn't it play, I guess? Oh, gosh, it was question. in more countries than I realized there were countries in the world. And they're like, yeah, it was on 150 countries. I'm like, there's 150 countries, you know? Like, I look at the globe. I thought there's only that many. <laughs> it was on in a lot of places. Um, most, still to this day, right here, right now, the most watched show in the history of television. That's insane. The, to this day, to right this now. Day. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. than Seinfeld, more than Friends, anything else. Any of that, yeah. All of it. Mm-hmm. Wow. I know, Are you getting any residual income from that? Very, very little. Really? It used to be more every time it plays. Um, it, it, it's less, which is it's funny because um, the whole like residual income um, stuff started after Gilligan's Island uh-huh. because all those actors like that show went so big. It was like yeah. kind of think the first one to go so big that it was on forever that the uh, Screen Actors Guild was like, okay, that's not right. You know, these people should see something. And Sherwood Schwartz um, was the creator of that show. Yep. And Doug Schwartz, who was one of the, the one of the main producers of Baywatch, is Sherwood's oh, son. Okay. So it's kind of a correlation there. But well, That's interesting. I didn't know that. So... What would it be like on a like a press tour or something where there were fans all over your 13, 14 year old kid, you're making fourteen thousand dollars a week, you're not really happy with what you're doing, but you're out there and you're getting all of this love and adoration from people you don't even know. What I mean, what was the worst or best or most crazy situation that you can remember? Well, it was it was really cool in the aspect that I had envisioned it and and thought if I worked hard enough that I would have it um if I practiced on my own um you know if I worked on my Michael Jackson moves and all that then watching Elvis and people you know screaming for him when I was a little kid um it was cool that when I would I would go on a press tour you know like teen magazine or or whatever and I'd be in a in a uh, you know in a tour bus with like kids from other TV shows you got the tool time kids there you know the the home improvement kids you got um, you know yeah f- boy meets world kids you know you got all oh, these yeah. different kids there and they're all signing autographs and stuff um, and so that part that stuff was kind of cool but of course uh, you know. It was always comparison. It was always... Uh, who was yeah, the biggest star? Who, yeah, who why, was... my line's shorter than their line, or I'm in the magazines less than they are. But I was also a little bit younger than everybody, you know, and I always wanted to be more grown up. I wanted, I, I always wanted to, like, right. you know, be... So during your time, what, I mean, was it the Saved by the Bell kids, or what is the yeah, biggest like, girl movie star that you dated during that time? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, well, uh, pretty much my first love ever was uh michelle williams who's uh you know i think academy award winning or or oscar for marilyn monroe she played marilyn monroe in the marilyn monroe movie um she was in brokeback mountain she's okay. Heath ledger's baby's mom she what was, show was she on she was then? on she was on baywatch with oh, okay. me she she played with my girlfriend one oh, season okay. and uh I begged the, you know, all the producers were bringing hot chicks on for themselves. I was like, D- t- throw me this bone, okay? I this girl's really cool. Can you bring her back? Can you bring her on one more time for me? You know, so they they had her come back on. She's actually from out here. She's from Solana Beach. Oh wow! Yeah. What about Topanga, dude? You ever go out with? Topanga? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I got pictures of her and I at Disneyland. I always, she's like, she's that girl that's so pretty and so cool. But it's like hard to make a move on her because she's like feels like a sister because she's so nice. She's uh-huh. got such a good spirit and yeah. and like just energy about her that you, it's kind of hard to be a sly devil with her. Like, hey, babe, what about right. boo? Because she's just so hard nice. To bust good, your moves on person, it. Such but- a good. So you do have a line that you won't cross. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Topanga was the line that he. I, wouldn't cross. I wanted to. I wanted to. She was just so darn sweet. Okay, so know? we can't talk about Baywatch without talking about two people on that show in particular. One is Pamela Anderson, and the other is the Hoff himself. Now, I was in the presence of the Hoff during a time in your life when you invited me to his house. Mm-hmm. And I swear to you guys, man, when, when the Hoff walked out, it was like this guy had a glow around him. Yeah, I mean, six foot six, six <laughs> foot seven, extremely <laughs> handsome. He was probably 60 years old when I yeah. met him at the time. Yeah. 
And we were all waiting for him to show up. He walked out and, and he stood head and shoulders above everyone, extremely handsome guy, and just had this, this aura about him. Big that was, energy, yeah. It was captivating, mm -hmm, man. Mm -hmm. You couldn't help but notice the guy. Yeah. What was it like being around him? I mean, was he really like a dad to you? It, or? I mean, it was, <clears throat> you know, Knight Rider was my show. I mean, oh, I was yeah. obsessed with that show. I had the Knight Rider big wheel. You know, I would pretend I was Knight Rider growing up. Dude, Knight Rider was in his front yard when we went there that day. Yeah, yeah. Kit, <laughs> Kit was Kit there. Kit was there, yeah. So I idolized Hasselhoff. Now, you know, if you can imagine, I'm 10 years old. I'm super hyper. I'm really energetic and uh, obsessive. And you know what I mean? Like, this is a, this is a dream come true for me. Um, and, you know, he's 30 you know, okay. and, and just getting off Night Rider with the pecs and the ha tan, hairy chest. You know, yeah. so it's, so if I imagine myself at thirty, I don't want a ten-year-old kid dragging along on my ankle. You know what I mean? Listening to every conversation I have <laughs> and stuff, and that was like me. So I pretty much annoyed him all the time, um, and I grew up without a dad. So like that, you know, please, 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 please. What are you? Where are you going? Like, can we go in your car? Like he always had cool cars. You know, yeah. so I was, I was a little annoying. It, it became more like the big brother relationship than the dad relationship so okay. but you know i i did grow up uh absorbing that that persona that he has that that bigger than life character and you know he taught me he taught me some really valuable lessons about believing in yourself you know and even as big of a star as he was back then i mean he was sponsored by audi they were giving him free cars back then and um he was doing music all over the world and i'd hear him on the phone with his agents and i'd hear him making deals for himself and he's he's very much a hustler. I think I absorbed some of that hustler mentality because he, he told me on multiple occasions, he said, Jeremy, nobody is ever going to believe in yourself more than you. And if you don't believe in yourself more than your agent, more than your manager, then you're screwed. You got to believe in yourself more than anybody. And you got to constantly convince them of what you have to offer, what you got, what you're capable of. And you would think that everybody just be chomping at the bit to get that guy you know and but they'd be calling uh, well i don't know you know what I mean? and you yeah. have to overwhelm them all the time um which you know can be kind of egotistical at times you know what i mean but when, in that industry it's, a, horn, must. it's yeah. a must and and he was a master of it and i think that's why he's been able to reinvent himself and stay so relevant for so long yeah i, I don't get overwhelmed by seeing too many people i'm not a big star guy but when i saw that guy i had to say i just sat back i didn't go up and try and get a picture i just observed his presence totally. and it was real and it was tangible man yeah it was really funny because we were in the house and his office was in there and he had a plaque on his desk it said the hoff on mm -hmm. it and so anita wanted to go in and kind of check it out so she's snooping around the hoff's office and no sooner did she come out, he came around the corner and almost right. busted her. And I can't imagine what would have happened. <laughs> but there were gold, you know, records everywhere from his stuff all around the world. But so it's the X factor. I mean, that's what yeah. it is, right? The je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Like he's, yeah. he's, got, he's it. got it. Not everybody has it. And I feel like 20 years ago in the entertainment, inter entertainment industry, you had to have that. To be a musician, to be an artist, to be an actor, to be a performer, you had to have the X factor. You had to have that thing that everybody wants, but very few people get. Um, but that that's changed a lot, you know. Oh, I yeah, think. with the internet and all yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But we don't want to get off on that. Let's talk about Pamela Anderson, you know, mm -hmm. probably the most lusted after woman on the planet at the time. You were around her every single day. What was your guys' relationship like? She was um, always so, so, so sweet, um, very kind. And uh, you what know, was the age difference between you and her? Unfortunately, too old. At the time. <laughs> uh, when she came on the show, I think I was 12 and she was probably like early 20s, you know, 12 okay. I mean, 22 or something like that. You know, 23, 24, right. maybe. OK, yeah. so, so she was big sis for sure and always really kind and sweet and always had great dogs and brought her family around. And um, I mean, at the time the most beautiful woman ever, you know? So do you feel as if she's kind of had, I don't want to say a bad rap because people don't look at her bad, but they don't really understand what a good person she was because they were just looking at her physique and, you know, the physical prowess that she brought to the screen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, maybe the reason why she was so wildly uh, lusted after and, 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 uh, 
successful is because of some of that, you know, some of that innocence and, yeah. and, and goodness shining through, you know what I mean? Right. But, uh, it it's might always be very attractive when that yeah. comes through when you don't try and force it. Yeah. Yeah. I just, a, a, an accident, a perfect accident, you know? Right. So you were also, I mean, you rapped some, you danced. I mean, there was more to you than just being the kid on Baywatch. What were some of the other parts of your career that mm -hmm. a lot of people might not know about? Well, um, <clears throat> you had an album out, a couple albums out, yeah, right? Yeah, when I was 12 years old, um, actually David Hasselhoff, you know, me being the, the always wanting more guy, you know, I was like, I want to come, I want to come, I want to come to Germany with you, I want to do music. He's like, well, let's write you a song. And we literally sit down, sat down at the lunch table uh, one day and he just on came, set like yeah. during a break yeah he just came up with a hook he said you can run you can hide you can cheat you can lie um, and we wrote this song uh, called You Can Run and it was about Adidas because Adidas sponsored me at the time okay shout out to Adidas if you guys ever want to flow me some more stuff please me too um, I'm boy yeah they, they took such good care of me anyway so he wrote a few bars and then we reached out to his good friend Mark Holden who's like now one of the guys from Australian Idol he produced Mila Jovovich's music um, from you know you know who she is um, and a, a, a lot of people, he's guys from, guy from Australia, really cool guy to work with. I got to work with a lot of really cool guys. And, uh, we wrote this song kind of about, about Adidas. You can run, you can hide, you can cheat, you can lie, but you can't run away from me. And, uh, with the beat Dude, and the sound Dude, how prophetic of my is that around. in your life though? That song. Think about that song in your life and where you've been. Just that, that verse right there. Yeah. I don't know the rest of the words in yeah. it, but you can run, you can hide, you can <laughs> cheat, you can lie, but you can't run away from me. Yeah. Bro. That's God in your life, but that's a whole different. That's a whole that's different a deep, thing. That's a deep podcast right there. We could go into that one. I, I know, and we yeah. will talk about that on another time because that is that's multiple shows. But so that song, what happened with it? That song broke me into. It was I was an inductee into the World Music Hall of Fame. What? Yeah, it debuted at number three in the European charts, and I, I'm not sure if it was, I was the youngest artist to debut at number three. I, I'm not sure the exact parameters of why I got the letter that said, you've been inducted into the World Music Hall of Fame, but I did, and, uh, you know, I, I recorded a, an album, a full album, in the studio, you know, like, See, dude, I didn't yeah. know that about you. I didn't know that you had that. And that's, that's the beauty of what we're doing here with this podcast, you guys. And you guys is, you know, as this relationship unfolds, it's unfolding right before your eyes. And there's a whole lot of history here. Do you ever trip out when you sit at home alone and you reflect on your life? All, Cause the other day, yesterday, Billy Graham died and I posted a video. I mean, I'm sorry, not a video, but a poster of me when I was on the Billy Graham team. Yeah, was that, and, was that the uh, uh, the tour? The, the yeah, I, I went into the, the prison, prison ministry. Yeah, yeah, but I was I was just kind of tripping out, thinking of all of the things that I've done in my life. Because oftentimes we forget about those, or we don't think about them, or we don't appreciate them. Right. You know? Do you ever trip out on that? What you've done? Um, no. Really? I mean, do you never overwhelmed it's, by TV singer? You know, all of this sort of thing. I've I've been, pretty much blocked it all out. Why? I don't know. Because, I mean, it's like that was then. This is now. It's what's next. You know, what's what's next? Like the stuff. I because because I, I haven't really unraveled it completely. But this could turn into a therapy session right before <laughs> your eyes right now. Because it? it was just always what I focused on so heavily and was such a real part of my everyday life, like breathing, drinking water, going to the gym. Like you don't remember every workout, right? Because it's no, just like what you do. Not every workout is a highlight, but I mean, you can't act as if those weren't big moments in your life and they're not things that stick with you. So I, I like for the stuff that seems really cool to other people, I seem to have like totally discredited or, or compartmentalized or put to the side. And like, I'll like be bragging about stuff that I think is cool. Like, oh, I got to, I trained with Uriah Faber and like right. I trained with Frank Mir and like it was so cool. Or well, like, that is cool. I surfed here or I surfed there. And like, that's the cool stuff to me. And they're like, people are like, bro, you were like, what? I'm like, yeah, uh, uh, the, Olympic Stadium in Germany, 15,000 people. Like, I performed with Two Unlimited and the Eurythmics and Pet Shop Boys. And, like, oh, yeah. Really? And I was like, yeah, right said Fred, I'm too sexy. Like, I won an award over top of them for like best new song and like got an award in Europe. I was, you know what I mean? Like, dude, are you guys listening to this? You don't know this about JJ. I'm, I'm bringing this too to sexy you. Sexy phone <laughs> What? 
I think I saw Wright said Fred at the some old guy just he just did this the whole time and lip sank to some. <laughs> they song. were buff back then. <laughs> they were buff, dude. That's funny. See, like man. that's all I remembered. Like I didn't rem- when I was <clears throat> winning the award and I'm 12 and I'm doing the photo shoot. I didn't remember like, oh my gosh, they're right, said Fred. I was like, oh, those guys are jacked. I want to get jacked like that when I grow up. Like always just a totally different focus. Well, I I get that. But now in hindsight is what I'm saying. Because, you know, we have to say this. You are the epitome of the Hollywood story of child star gone bad. Well, the (laughs) epitome, luckily not, because the childhood, they're all, so many are dead, dude. Yeah. If you look at how many have killed themselves or overdosed, dude, there's like- Like who? who? My mom was Googling it the other day. There's like at least 20 childhood stars that you will remember big time, and they killed themselves or, or died of an overdose. It's, and it's well, I know Andrew Koenig was one of them because I did the Batman Dead End movie with yeah. him, you know, and he was on uh, Growing Pains. Mm-hmm. He played Boner, right? But dude, that I, I'm like tripping out. We could sit here and continue. I want to talk more about your career. And so, what are some other things that you've hidden away in your mind that you don't want to talk about that we need to talk about today? Because that's what this podcast dig is dig them about. out, man. I don't dig them out. They're hard for me to remember because they don't hold that the that vibration. They don't hold that right. that we, don't. that cool thing. So could it be because you? might be still wanting to be that actor and you're not getting the opportunities that you think you should? Or maybe it's that I want to achieve new greatness. I want, I I do in my interior. I believe that that's not the biggest thing I'm going to do. I believe that as well. I believe that all of what we're talking about is setting you up to do something much bigger. And again, that's a whole nother conversation that I don't believe people are ready here yet. We got to kind of bring them in slowly to the to the real core of all of this, mm-hmm. and we know what that is. But do you, inside of you right now, have this burning desire to be in front of... Because when I first introduced you that time, you said you have more than 2,000 hours in front of the camera. Right, right. Do you yearn to be in front of that camera again, mm-hmm. acting on any level? No. Really? No yearn. I, if, you know... If someone called me and, and told me they had got, had a job for me, one I'd be excited because it's good money. It's right. ridiculous money compared to regular, work, right? You know, um, which I'm very used to now. Regular work, regular pay. But um, also, I would be very confident in my abilities. You know, as far as breaking the script down, creating my character, knowing my knowing my backstory, showing up on time, taking direction well. Um, you know, I know how to do the job right. well, so I would, you know, I, I get jobs, hey, can you come teach on nutrition at this rehab? And I'll be like, oh crap, I better like get this stuff together. And I get a little stressed about it. Like, oh, I need to hit a home run for these guys. You know, I, I need to really bring it. But if, when it would come to acting, I wouldn't get uh, nervous or be like, oh, oh crap, I better get my stuff together. It's like a, it's like a process I've been doing for so long. It's super easy. Um, uh, and I, but I like it. I enjoy it. So it's not stressful. Like some of the stuff that I do now, I get stressed out about because I'm not feeling like uh, I've been doing it for a million years, but, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, yearn for it, but probably because I know so, uh, so many other people do, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's almost like, ugh, if you want it that bad, like take it. Like, yeah. You e- even, it. even it's an interesting career because it doesn't go to the best man. It, you know, to be, to have an athlete mentality, which I believe I have it, to the, to, to the victor does, you know, Spoils, don't the, go, yeah, man. yeah. The, the better you do, it, you know, nice you, can't, guys. you can't perform yeah. well and get the job. So tell me this, when it all ended, how hard was that for you? So how old were you and what was the deal? I mean, it went from, did it go from 60 to zero really quick or how did it, how did it Pretty stop? much, pretty really? much. Yeah. What was, what was that like? Well, you know, <clears throat> so you know, we, we kind of touched on me always wanting more, more accolades, more approval, not really cherishing what I had in the moment and just thinking about what I need to do better or what I need to, to have more of or why I'm not as famous as the other kids or whatever. So, you know, I, I started uh, partying a lot, you know, I'm like 14 or you know, stealing my own money and getting limos and drugs for all my friends and 
be paying older friends rent just so I could kick it at their house and paying for, you know, like loser friends to get their cars out of impound, you know, have like a 16 year old friend that like ran away from their parents, but they had a car, but it was an imp- impound because they didn't have money to pay their ticket. So I'd get it out of impound just so we could have a car to drive around. In. So I started going around the, the lower companionship, they call it. Yeah. Um, really kind of a user myself because I'm using them because I'm lonely and I want to have fun and I want to run away from life or I want to mess up real bad. I mean, most teenagers do want to experiment and stretch their wings and, and make mistakes and, and do what they're told not to do, right? I mean, well, you had more means than I most had people. a lot more means, yeah. The means to kill myself, really. So, so I went way out there. Should you be dead right now? Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? It's, okay. an, it's a miracle I'm alive. Um, only by divine intervention for sure. Um, modern day Jonah pulled out of the belly of the beast for sure. A hundred percent. Um, and, uh, you know, so I just went way too far, you know, and my partying and my, uh, you know, uh, adventures started costing me my ability to show up and perform and be a kid so your professionalism was start. What you just were so proud of was that starting to go away because big time, yeah. So I'm I'm showing up not remembering my lines, oh, wow. not have slept the night before, feeling like crap, and that the 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 feelings of shame or guilt or embarrassment, like oh my gosh, like this thing that I do so well that I've always been great at, which is what got me jobs and what made everybody love me. Now I can't remember my lines, and they're like directors are pulling me aside. Other actors, David's pulling me aside, dude. Or, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, are you stoned or something? And I'm like, I can't tell him. Like, oh my gosh, I've been up for like three nights, partying my face off, and I can barely even stand here in this blazing sun and, and do my lines. You know what I mean? Like, it was torment. So tell me that episode that I watched the other morning that I sent you a chunk of, where you were under the bridge and you fell on the mattress and you were running with the skateboard and all that. Uh-huh. Were you not yet? Okay, no, not, yet. not at young, that time. Too young for that. Okay. It was, I think, around the time my hair got short because I was partying with some friends and I just shaved my head. You did a Britney Spears on it. I did a Britney Spears, yeah. Before she even did it. You were the OG <laughs> I of did the it hair, all shaving before the head. Everybody did it. <laughs> like, okay, so back in the day, I remember I was touring Europe, doing huge concerts, doing nightclubs. Uh, and, uh, and I remember when I think it was. Backstreet Boys, it was Backstreet Boys or NSYNC, or um, you know, because I can remember thinking, well, New Kids on the Block haven't been around for a while, and I'm like, now I'm the only kid, so I'm not copying them because I'm solo, uh, but um, I'm not jumping on their coattails. But then when NSYNC or Backstreet Boys started getting a little bit of popularity, I can remember being like, who do these young guys think they are coming to take my music? You know what I mean, like. Like no way, there's no way they're gonna they're gonna take my title as like the up and coming big music youngster, you know. So you're on the cover of like Teen Magazine and all oh, those all things. That. All that, yeah, dude, that's crazy. Especially man. in Europe, you know, uh, America wasn't as much. I didn't do the music over here. So Although, when you went to Europe, you got out of the plane in Europe. Were there people waiting on you? And oh stuff? yeah, signs, yeah. girls freaking out, passing yep. out, crying like the Beatles, feeling like the Beatles, man. Really? Yeah. And it was a big, that was a big rush. That was a big high. You know, I have arrived. The hard work has paid off. You know, it's come, the, the prophecy is coming to fruition, you know? Um, so that was, that was a dream come true for me, you know? And I did my job well. I mean, that's why I, I think I accelerated so fast, you know, wh- whether it was a, interviews with magazines or, or whatever or on camera, um, I was prepared for it, man. Yeah. I had been plotting it for years. I had been practicing it in my bedroom alone, interviewing myself. I was With totally ready. Hairbrushes and the whole bit, totally. just like you see on mm-hmm, TV, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. That's like real stuff that people do, and you yeah. were doing it. Yeah. That's legit, man. Yeah. That's crazy. So how, what's you said 15,000 at the Olympic Stadium in yeah. Germany. Is uh-huh. that the largest crowd you ever sang Jeremy. and performed to? Really? Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy. So you're backstage. Are you Lights nervous off, as hell? Lighters right? up. All really? That, yeah. Wow, dude. Can you feel it right now? Like yeah, I just felt it a little bit. I just felt it a little bit. And it made me have to go pee. That's the one thing. No matter how many times you go there. There you go. <laughs> no matter how many times you go pee, two seconds before you go on that stage, you're like, I have to pee so bad. And then as soon as you get out there, it goes away. It's really, really? weird. Yeah. 
I saw the dude from train one time. He peed his pants a little bit. He hit a high note, and I just saw, like, on his jeans, all of a sudden, a little pee stain showed up. Which guy? The lead singer. Yeah. I got an eye. You know, that, and he hit this high yeah, note, yeah, and all yeah. of a sudden, I don't know why I was looking at his wiener, but he peed all of a sudden. I guess I <laughs> saw it. <laughs> you ever pee or fart when you were singing? Uh, I'm sure I farted. <laughs> No, I but don't, do, definitely that, haven't peed. That's crazy. You have all those people screaming and yelling. You go out there and you do how how many songs in a set? Would you I, do? I did few, like five songs, I think, three to five songs. Wow. Yeah. And, and then, then after that, what would it be like? Boobs, really? And they're, they're passing and, out. Security's tr- carrying them over because they're totally unconscious. They're taking them out of harm's way. I had a human tunnel one time. I showed up to this TV show in, in, in Holland. Holland is really where I got the most fame. And I, it's so nice out there. The people are so cool. But um, I showed up and I remember thinking, man, look at all these people for the other guys, you know, because th- they were all looking towards the studio. And the other guys were insane. It was, it was the uh, Eurythmics. You know, sweet dreams. Made. They're all making come. They're all touring right all now. You, still, you, you should know? do another tour with somebody, you never, dude. Yeah, never know. <laughs> yeah, never know. You can't run. You can't hide. <laughs> you can't lie. <laughs> but then they turned their heads and they were there for me. They had wow. been waiting there for me. So they security had to come out because the car was rocking. Security had to come out and form a human tunnel. And there was people with scissors. Like, they wanted a piece of my hair. I was, like, pretty dangerous. Like, just me and my mom. And I'm, like, pretty spindly little kid, you know. Uh, somebody got my shoe. Somebody managed to get my wow. shoe. I, like, reached I wonder if that person through. still has your shoe and says, I got Jeremy Jackson's I shoe. I hope so. Where are you? <laughs> Give him lock the shoe of, back. If you got a lock of my hair or a shoe, I want to be your friend now. Dude, your mom's been there every step of the way. Yes, I remember Carlo and Irene. Yes, and telekids. <laughs> How funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, man. This is this is some good stuff, you guys. You know, we like I said, we're gonna you, we're not gonna get a better guest than my co host and my brother and my buddy right here and Jeremy Jackson. So what are what are some other things that these conversations are bringing up inside of you. And how do you feel right now? I mean, does it make you feel kind of good or sick or anxious or what is it? What is the emotion you're feeling right now? You know, it's for me, it feels like I've been telling the story for so long and people have been wowed by the story for so long. It almost feels artificial or superficial. Like they can't really still care. They can't really still think it's cool. There's no way. Dude, I've this told world this story is infatuated a million by stars. times. Okay, like, I want to hear cool. some stuff that you've never told anyone else in an interview well, ever. Uh, man, I don't right know. Now, I don't right know. Here. But what I think is cool, what I think is cool and what I search for in life is like, you met me. You didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't brag about myself. But the minute I saw you, you I'm like, dude, I know you from somewhere. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. But but after we talked for a minute, you knew that on the interior, there was some gravity and some magnetism that you knew could do well in in yeah i didn't care about any of that stuff industry. i liked you as a person right and i've never asked you anything about your career ever until now and this is right, strictly right, for right. this podcast but i'm really entertained by it all well that's what you know that and, amazes and, me and so here's what you need to understand you say you tell this story all the time and you're amazed at the fact that people jim is entertained by it i'm entertained by it the people on your live are entertained by it because all, this is all stuff, two of them this <laughs> this world that we live in is infatuated by stars and Hollywood and, and everything that it seems to be mm-hmm. that we imagine that it is because we all on some level want what you had. Yeah. And when you recollect and tell those stories, it's it's captivating to us and we connect with it because, like I said, on some level, everybody wants that. Most uh-huh. everybody, right? So as a guy that has yearned for some of that my, myself, I... I am intrigued by it and I'm fascinated by the fact that I get it you know it's not that big of a deal to you because you lived it but I really need to know what it what kind of feeling does it bring up inside of your body right now you know what I mean is it a good one is it a bad one is it a mixture of all of them it's not good or bad it's I'm I'm wondering now like so then is it my mission to encourage people that 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 no matter how famous they are, how much money they have, or no matter how many people love and want them, it won't make them any happier? Or is it my mission to get it back for the people who love and believe in me and support me? 
It could be both because sometimes we don't get it back until we understand that the mission is to let people realize that it's not that big of a deal. Maybe on some level you haven't really reconciled that in your life yet. And that could be or maybe the reason why it hasn't been released to you yet. Because it's so cool. Ooh, that was that, deep. I don't yeah, know if everyone I, got I get, that. No, I got it. Because it. it's so freaking cool that if I really take the time to acknowledge and honor how cool it was. That's what I'm trying Something to that I let go that I'll be crushed. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Yeah. You know? So maybe it's like a defense mechanism. I think on some level it is. Well, I It has to be. And the only solace I get is I think I'm the way I think I got famous because I am the way I am. I don't think being famous made me the way I am. I no. was like that before, you know, and a, but a lot of people like, and that's another thing is dealing with pe normal people in everyday life. It, when you've had that is a strange and inauthentic interaction because people think that you are behaving in a way based on you, you're an actor or you're an entertainer that you're selling them something or that you're lying. And I'm like, or create, you know what I mean? So they're like asking you questions. They wouldn't, it, the, the I have way more fun interacting with people with the beard and the long hair like that have no idea who I am and I get these authentic moments, you know, and as soon as they figure it out, they change. Yeah. It's really weird. Yeah, it is, huh? So I don't like, I'd rather be normal and incognito and just get some honesty and some authenticness because being forced to survive and thrive, being just you can't really thrive, but survive in a world where everybody is interacting with you based on who they think you are, what you, they think they know about you from the internet or from your fame, or second guessing everything you do, is is not fun. Okay, so think about your perspective then. So I was watching something yesterday on Prince. Think about Prince, Michael Jackson, Heath Ledger, these guys that are no longer with us. And the people can't understand. They're like, oh, my God, if I was famous, I would be really happy. Imagine the turmoil, because I'm, you've lived it, right? Mm -hmm. That these guys on that level of success have gone through by themselves going, I just want a normal freaking life. So what? I'm an actor. Big deal. So this guy goes to the steel mill every day. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. That's his job. This is just my job. I mean, how crazy must that be for somebody to live in this prison that they wanted so bad in their life at one time. Now it's turned into something that's just a monster. It's out right, of control. Right, right. So is it a blessing or a curse that I'm able to transcend that or cross that line and, and be normal sometimes? And still alive, because you said still alive. like 20 childhood stars that, you know, yeah. Yeah. are no longer around. Or more, and it's you trip out. You'd be like, oh my gosh, yeah, I totally remember that. Why didn't I hear about him? Why didn't somebody help him? What went wrong? So two things. Do you think that there could be, we'll call it a ministry or a, a purpose for you to speak to these kids who are coming up in Hollywood right now? So what do you what do you feel when you look at a young kid who's 13 years old, he's on a hit show, you know he's making money, and you know better than I do what kind of life he's living? Do you Does your heart kind of reach out to him? Yeah, you know, and years ago when I was doing pretty well in my life, um, I... I thought there needs to be a curriculum. There needs to be a workshop there because they're going, they're having onset NFL teachers. NFL has it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. They have onset teachers, right? Uh -huh. They don't go to regular school. So if there was a process curriculum to, you know, uh, forewarn them about what's going to happen, what they can expect, tools they can use. So nothing like that exists to this no, point your knowledge. No, not that I know of. Why don't you create some? Uh, I, 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 I probably won't, but I should. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I mean, if they had that information, the NFL right now, these guys, they're 19 years old. They're suddenly signed to a $72 million five-year mm -hmm. contract, mm -hmm. and they got all their homies and everybody reaching at them. They don't know how to manage that new life. Because right. really, that is a new life. You've gone from a regular college kid, you know, for the most part as a college athlete, to now a superstar like you experienced with no guidebook. Like parents will often say, well, I, there was no guidebook to be a parent. There's no guidebook to be a child star. Right. 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 It's, it's, it's a really good uh, Otherwise, you'll end concept. up here. Yeah, because kids are, what, what, what it, why? Because kids are expendable. They're going to grow up and you're not, they're not really going to want them anyway. Like you just get a new cute kid. Dude, it happens all the time, man. I'm friends with Leo Howard, right? Leo yeah. Howard was on Kicking It. And this, you know, he had the long hair. And the other day I was watching a Disney show and I thought, is that Leo Howard? No, it's another kid that looks exactly like him. He fit, it's like the Brady oh, Bunch. Remember yeah. the Brady Bunch episode where Greg fit the jacket and mm -hmm. he was in the band just because he fit the jacket. Mm -hmm. So if you fit the mold, 
that Hollywood's looking for to recycle the exact same show over and over and over and over again because you got the hair. They know the formula that works. Yep, man. yep. Very, very superficial, you know? That's crazy. This is good stuff, man. I didn't realize our podcast, my camera died over there. Hopefully camera died. No, 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 no. Okay, we got 11 people. We're going to say bye to them uh, because we're going to switch over to... Uh, to Instagram. Okay, switch over to Instagram at, while we're going. At we're Jeremy Jackson st- Fitness on Instagram at Jeremy Jackson Fitness. At Jeremy Jackson. This is brought to you by CBT's Performance Apparel. You got Clark Bartram here with Jeremy Jackson. We are going to take a little break right now and come back with a very entertaining, a very inspirational, motivational, dear friend of mine, Mr. Jeremy Jackson, on the Untitled Podcast. Mm-hmm.